Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our second lecture. This lecture is on uh, 1D kinematics and it's for the non-calculus based students only. There's no calculus in this lecture. Okay, uh, so what is 1D kinematics? What do we mean by this word uh, kinematics? So in physics the word kinematics refers to a mathematical description of motion. It's some way that we can mathematically describe things that are moving okay uh, in the 1d part of it is because we're just moving along a straight line okay so we're gonna start off by studying 1d kinematics later on we will study 2d kinematics uh, but 2d kinematics requires a more complicated mathematics because in 1d there's only two directions either to the left or to the right in which will be positive and negative but in 2d there's actually an infinity of directions and so we'll have to introduce vectors and that's for later okay so we'll just start off with 1d kinematics and um, We'll get start off by sh I'll start off by showing you how to give a mathematical description of that. So how would we do that? How would we give a mathematical description of uh, to some motion? So I can't do a demonstration for you. Uh, so we'll have to imagine uh, a scenario, and uh, that's my picture that I have right here. Imagine that a car is driving down the street. Now the car is not going to be driving uh, at a constant speed. It's actually going to stop and turn around. So it's going to have some fairly complicated motion. I can't draw all of that on this diagram, uh, but we'll see that as we uh, go on. And so um, here's my, my triangular car here. I'm sorry, I'm not a very good drawer, but you know, here's a car and it's going to be moving down the road and here's the car at a later time. And uh, how do we start off by giving a mathematical description of this? Well, um, and by the way, you'll actually be doing this in the lab and only instead of doing it with a car, you'll be doing it with a linear air track and a glider. Okay. And, um, so it's the exact same thing that you'll be doing in the lab, but here I'm just referring to this fictitious situation of a car driving down the street. So the first thing we need is a ruler because we are going to be measuring length. Okay, and so you can see down here along the bottom, along the road here, I've put down this ruler. Okay, and uh, this ruler, it's uh, um, uh, we can call it the plus x axis here, like that. Here's a ruler, and of course the ruler has some gradations on it. There's zero meters, one meter, two meter mark, three meter mark, and so on. And the ruler, you know, when you put a ruler down to measure something. You, you have a choice where to put the zero. So we're going to choose a reference point for that zero. And you can see here I've got this picture of a tree. And so we're going to put the zero of the ruler right on the tree. And that's our origin. Okay. So when we answer, ask questions like, where is this thing? We'll always be answering that question with respect to the tree. Like, where is the car with respect to the tree? Okay. And that's known as the origin. All right. So that's one thing that we need is we need a ruler to measure uh, position, but we also need a watch or a clock to measure measure time. Okay. And that's because this car isn't just sitting in one place. Okay. If the car were always sitting at this one place, I could say, oh, I'm just going to measure where this car is, period. Uh, but no, the car is going to be at one place at one time. It's going to be at a different place at a different time and a different place at a different time. And so we need to know where the car is, that is what X is at all different values of time. Okay. And so I've tried to indicate that uh, the car at two different positions here. Uh, at t equals zero, this is like when our clock actually shows zero seconds. The car is at this point here. Okay, and that's uh, um, below I have that as 1.6 meters. Okay, and then later, a second later, the car is over here and it is at, um, at uh, the three meter mark like that. Okay, so at t equals one second, it's at the three meter mark. By the way, like I said, you're going to be doing this in the lab and just to clear up a little ambiguity, you'll see this in the lab. You might say, well, when I go to measure where the car is, should I measure from the front of the car? Should I measure from the back of the car, the middle of the car? It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Okay, so we're really asking the question, where is the back? of the car at any given time. And so you can see here that I'm going to be measuring at the back of the car there. So you can see the back of the car here at t equals one second is uh, three meters. As long as you're consistent, it's it's fine. You could have chosen the front of the car, but don't switch between front and back. Okay. And so there's our, our um, little fish experiment and you can imagine uh, you know doing a movie here taking video of this and then just like looking at where the car is on the ruler so when I say where it is like measure it off on the ruler at all different given times and you can form a little chart like this okay so you know you ask the question where is the car at t equals zero and the answer is 1.6 meters where is the car at one second it's at three meters and you can just keep doing that and then you can form a little chart like this okay and so here you could see I have t equals zero seconds one second two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. All right. And here's where it is x at the zero second mark so at zero seconds it's at 1.6 at one second it's at three meters at two seconds it's at four meters three seconds 3.0 and then at four seconds it's at one meter by the way we're measuring from the tree so you can see that it starts 1.6 meters it gets further from the tree further from the tree but then it starts to get closer to the tree so at some point the car stopped and 
uh, started moving in the opposite direction. All right, so basically you've got this movie and you say, okay, where's the car at zero seconds? You look at the ruler and you go, oh, it looks like it's at 1.6 meters. And then you go, where's the car at one second? And you say three meters and so on, okay? Now, there's a difference between experimental and theoretical here. Experimentally, you can only ha do this at a finite number of times, okay? Like you can't do this at every, like an infinity of times here. Right? So you're only going to have a discrete number of times. So here we chose 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 seconds and so on. Maybe our clock had smaller gradations. Maybe it had tenths of a second. Like uh, you probably have this on your phone too. I have a stopwatch on my phone and I think it goes down to hundredths of a second. So you could say, you know, where was the car at half a second? All right. And it's not in this chart. OK, or where was the car at a tenth of a second or where's the car at 1.5 seconds or 2.5 seconds and so on. Well, you know, you could do it a little bit more fine grading, but you can't do it infinitely fine grading. So experimentally, you're always going to have a finite set of numbers here. Theoretically, we can fill in the gap. Now, you can't possibly write that in a chart because that, like I said, that would be an infinity of numbers here because it would be at every instant of time. And that's like infinity of times there. But, you know, theoretically, you can do that. All right. So in the lab, you're actually going to get a chart that looks like this. Uh, you won't do it manually. You'll have a computer and the computer is going to be hooked up to this uh, photo gate, which is just a device that sees, you know, as a glider moves through it and is able to say, you know, where the glider is at given times. But you'll see it actually come out on a spreadsheet. It's only at finite times. There's only positions at finite times, okay? But like I said, theoretically, we could fill in the gaps here. We could fill in all the infinity of times between zero and one seconds and write down all those x's in there. And you say, how do you do that? What mathematical structure does that? And that's what a function is, okay? And so x, which is what we, which, which is what we'll call the position. So x is the position, is actually turns out to be a function of time, and time is going to be t. Now, uh, just to distinguish this from mathematics, uh, you know, like in math class, you probably had functions, and in math class, when you had functions, you probably wrote them as y is equal to f of x. Okay. Well, in math class, you you take the x variable as the independent variable. That's the variable that when you graph it goes along the horizontal axis and y as the dependent variable which goes along the uh, vertical axis okay but that's not the case here in our case time is going to be the independent variable okay and x is the function all right and so here's our function so this isn't multiplication don't think of this as x times t this is x as a function of t and what it means the, the the word function in mathematics has a very rigorous definition it means that if i put in one value of time I get out one and only one value of x. Okay, so given a particular time, the object is at one and only one position. Well, that makes sense. You know, like at at, at a given time, the object isn't in two different places or three different places. At at one given time, it's only at one position. And so there it is. Theoretically, we have the position at all times during the interval from zero to four seconds. Okay, uh, experimentally, like I just said, you can't do that because you don't have an infinite gradation in your instrument. Your instrument only goes down to a certain level. And in this particular experiment, let me go back up to the chart here. Uh, maybe all I had was just like one second intervals okay so you know like I had a frame at zero seconds I have a frame at one second I have a frame at two seconds I have a frame at three seconds and another one at four seconds so I can say where it is at zero one two three and four seconds but I can't say where it is at 0.5 seconds I just don't have that information experimentally there's going to be a limit all right but mathematically or theoretically you could say yeah you know it's a function I'm going to pretend like I know its position at every single interval in space okay now um, what is this business of giving a full mathematical description? Well, that function, x is a function of t, contains all the information about the motion of the, uh, of the object, okay? There are other things you can ask about it, other kinematic quantities, but all of those kinematic quantities ultimately come out of this function here, okay? So x is a function of time, is the position. And what does that function answer? It answers questions like, where is this thing at a given time? Uh, how far has it traveled from the origin at a given time? And the sign of this thing, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sign later, uh, but the sign of this thing, if it's positive, if x is positive, then it's on the right side of the tree. And if it's negative, it's on the left side of the tree, okay? And so everything that you want to know about the position of this thing is of the object is comes out of this function x is a function of time okay but like i said there's other kinematic quantities that you want to ask 
questions about, like velocity, okay, or speed. Right? So we'll use the word uh, velocity in this class. So there's another function, velocity as a function of time. It's actually derivable from the position as a function of time. Okay, And it answers questions like, how fast is this thing going? All right? So if you want to know its velocity at a given time, say the velocity at one second, this is the function that gives you the velocity at one second. Okay, And um, uh, it also has a sign, but the sign is interpreted a little bit differently. Again, I'm going to go over the signs quite a bit later uh, after we do some problems. But right now, if the sign of the velocity is positive, it means that it's moving to the right. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily to the right or to the left of the tree, but it's moving to the right. And if the sign is negative, it's moving to the left. Okay. And there is a third kinematic quantity that's of interest known as the acceleration. All right. It's also derivable from either the velocity or the position. All right. So, so each one of these comes out of the position. All right. But it answers yet a different question. It answers the question, is the car speeding up or is it slowing down? OK, now velocity and acceleration are often confused. And so um, I'll try to be very careful with this. Uh, the velocity is something like um, if you're driving in the city, uh, it's like 30 miles an hour. Or if you're in Canada using the metric system, it's 50 kilometers per hour. Now, if you're driving at 50 kilometers per hour and you don't speed up and you don't slow down, you're 50 kilometers an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, your velocity is 50 kilometers an hour. But because you're not speeding up and you're not slowing down, your acceleration is actually different, uh, zero. OK, so so let me let me say that again to be very clear. If you're driving at a constant 50 kilometers per hour, you're not speeding up or slowing down. Your acceleration is zero. All right. However, suppose that you're at a stop and when you're at a stop, your velocity is zero and you step on the gas. Well, then, you know, you're going to start off at zero kilometers per hour. Then you're going to get up to 10. Then you're going to get up to 20. Then you're going to get up to 30, 40, and then eventually 50 kilometers per hour. Well, look at what's happening. You're, you're speeding up. You're going from 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And you know, look at your speedometer. You can see your speedometer increases okay, until you get up to 50 kilometers an hour. That's acceleration. That's speeding up. All right. Similarly, if you're driving at 50 kilometers per hour and you hit the brakes, you were going 50, then you slow down to 40, 30, 20, 10, and then finally 0. That's We usually say that's deceleration, but it's also an, it's an acceleration in the sense that the velocity is changing over time. So if your velocity is constant, you have no acceleration. If you're speeding up, you have positive acceleration. If you're slowing down, it's that negative acceleration. I'll go through those signs a lot more carefully uh, in, after we do some problems. Okay. So there's intuitively the three different kinematic quantities that um, uh, you know we'll be dealing with in the course. All right. And um, now what's the question now is uh, because I alluded to the fact that uh, a and v can be derived from t you might say well how do you do that because experimentally remember our experiment we have like a movie and we see where the car is at all these different times and then you want to ask a question about its acceleration and you go how do i get information about acceleration out of information about position or how do i get information about velocity out of uh, position okay and that's not obvious at first all right. Well, let me just say that to really answer that question, you need calculus. So I'm not going to fully answer that question for you guys. And that's OK. We won't need it to, to solve problems. But uh, Newton, who actually worked with this uh, to start with, he not only invented the physics that I'm showing you right now, he also invented calculus at the same time because he needed the calculus to solve these kinds of problems. So I can't fully answer that question for you, but I can give you some pretty good intuition, which is good enough for uh, for our purposes. OK, and to answer the question, uh, how does velocity and acceleration come out of position? I need to distinguish two different types of velocities and two different types of accelerations. And this is the difference between an average and instantaneous. OK, so there's an average and instantaneous velocity and there's an average and instantaneous acceleration. Let's start off with the average velocity because that's the easiest one to understand. OK, so remember, like, don't lose sight of what we're doing. You know, we have this position as a function of time and now we want to get velocity information out of that. So how does that work? So average velocity means the velocity over some period of time. OK, and over some finite time interval is the mathematically precise way of saying it. And it's defined like this. Well, first, the symbol is a V with a bar on top. If you've taken any statistics class, usually when you put a bar on top of some variable, it means the average of that variable. OK, so this is the 
average velocity, all right, and is by definition the distance you travel, the change in the position divided by the change in time, the time interval that it took to, to travel that, okay? And, um, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, let me give you a very simple example. Uh, Niagara Falls, New York is about 30 miles from, um, from Buffalo, okay? And it takes about half an hour to get there. So the delta x is how far did you travel? Basically your change in position, okay? Exactly why it's a change in position. You'll see that in our first problem, but it's the distance you traveled. So that's like 30 miles because I'm going from Buffalo to Niagara Falls, 30 miles. And how long did that take? Half an hour, okay? Half. So if you take 30 and divide it by half, it turns out to be 60 miles per hour, okay? So if you travel 30 miles in half an hour, you're on average traveling 60 miles per hour, okay? And that's the meaning of the average velocity. I can sort of show you how it's different from instantaneous velocity even now. Instantaneous velocity is what you read on your speedometer. It's like how fast you're going right at this instant, not over the whole trip. So, you know, yeah, on average, I was traveling 60 miles per hour as I went to Niagara Falls, New York. But that doesn't mean I was traveling 60 miles an hour all the way along. I mean, sometimes I might have been going 55. Sometimes I might have been going 65. Sometimes I might have been going 40. Sometimes I might have been going exactly 60. You know, your velocity goes up and down, up and down. I mean, you know, you you I'm most of you have been driving for a while now. So you know that when you're driving, you speed up a little bit, you slow down. You can't stay in exactly 60 for, for various reasons. But on average, over the whole trip, because you traveled 30 miles in half an hour, okay, you're traveling 60 miles per hour on average. Okay, so there's the idea of the average. Now, let's do a problem with that so that we really solidify that and we also really understand what that delta x means because it's the change in position and also the delta t. Let's apply this definition to the table that I have up above. I'm not going to keep scrolling up and down, but, um, you know, I'm just referring to that table right now. So, whoops. Uh, using the above table, find the average velocity for, now remember it's an interval, it's over an interval of time. So find the average velocity from zero seconds to one second, okay? Part B is find the average velocity from one second to two second. And then for part C is find the average velocity over the whole trip, which is from zero to four seconds, okay? And so um, there's, there's three different average velocities that we wanna calculate. Okay, so let's do the average velocity from zero to one second. Let's do that first. So we start off here with the definition, that's the formula that I just gave you, the average velocity is equal to delta x over delta t. Now, what do we mean by delta x? Well, whenever you have a delta, that's a change, okay? And so that's like your final position minus your initial position, okay? Don't confuse the distance you traveled with the position. The position is how far you are from the tree. And the distance you traveled is the change in the position. So if you're at one distance from the tree and then you're at a different distance from the tree, you subtract those two distances and that's how far you travel. And so you take the position at t equals one second and subtract from that the position at t equals zero seconds. Okay. So again, this is functional notation. I'm not multiplying here. So this is x at t equals one second minus x at t equals zero seconds. And to get x at one second, just look at the table above. And at one second, the car was three meters from the tree. At zero seconds, it was 1.6 meters from the tree. So x of one minus x of zero is three minus 1.6, and there's your numerator. Now the delta t is how long was that interval? Well, it's pretty obvious you went from zero seconds to one second. So on the bottom, you have one, which is your final time minus your initial time. That's what you read off of the clock, all right? And so that's one second minus zero seconds. So that's one on the bottom, and that turns out to be 1.4 meters per second, okay? So the average velocity, during that time interval from zero to one second was 1.4 meters per second, okay? Now, before I do part B, uh, every time I introduce a new concept of physics, a new quantity, like velocity, I'm gonna show you the units, okay? Now, last class, I told you that lengths were measured in meters, but now we have a new concept, velocity. What are the units of velocity? Okay, so over here, this these square brackets here, when you put square brackets around a variable like that, it means what are the units of? So what are the units of the average velocity? Well, to answer that question, you have to look at the units of the formula that gives you that average velocity. And the formula was 
the distance traveled divided by the time. Okay. Now the units of the distance traveled, that's still meters. Okay. So if you're at one particular meter mark and then in another meter mark, you know, when you subtract the two, the answer still comes out in meters. So there's the numerators in meters and the denominator, which is your time that's in seconds. And so the units for velocity are meters per second. Now here I'm doing it for the average velocity. It's the same for the instantaneous velocity. Okay. So whether you're talking average or instantaneous velocity, you're velocity units are meters per second. Okay, so great. There's uh, part A. Let's do part B. Same idea, but now the numbers are different. Okay, so in part B, I wanted the average velocity from one second to two seconds. So that, there's another time interval. Okay, so start off with the formula again. Average velocity is delta x over delta t. The delta x here is now the final position is the position at t equals two seconds minus the initial position, which is the position at one second. Okay, divided by the delta t, you end up at two seconds. You started at one second, so it's two minus one. All right, and that gives you, if you crunch through the numbers, one meter per second. Okay, and uh, if you wonder where did I get x of two, well, if you look up at that chart up above, that sorry, that that table, and you look at the two second mark, and you read across there, at two seconds, the car was at four meters. Okay, and at one second, the car was at three meters. Okay, so that's where I got the four and the three. All right, so x of two is four and x of one is three, like that. All right, and that turns out to be one meter per second. Well, during the first second, part A, it was 1.4 second, 1.4 meters per second, and now it's slowed down a little bit. Now it's only traveling at one meter per second. Okay, and then the final question was uh, part C of the problem was what's the average velocity over the whole trip? And it starts off at t equals zero and it ends at t equals four seconds, so you want the whole thing. So again, you've got the delta x, but now your final is x at four seconds minus x at zero seconds, divided by the time interval is four minus zero, okay? So it's a four second interval. And if you do that, if you take a look at x at four seconds, that was one meter, and x at zero, that's its initial position, was 1.6. So one minus 1.6 is actually negative 0.15 meters per second. Okay, after dividing by four. Okay, so one minus 1.6 divided by four is negative 1.15 meters per second. Okay, and so um, there's the answer there. Now, let's go back because the signs are a little bit tricky. Let's go back and actually look at the original diagram so we can really understand what's going on with these signs. And so just keep in mind that, you know, this, this sign here is actually negative. So let's go back here to the diagram. All right. What do the signs mean? So let me go over the position. The position, when the position is positive, that's when x is greater than zero, you're to the right of the tree. Because see, this is zero, that's positive one, positive two, positive three, and so on. So when x is positive, you're on the right side of the tree. Now we don't have that in this case, but you can have x negative. And if x is negative, then you would be here like a negative one, negative two, you'd be to the left of the tree. So when you're talking about x, if x is positive, you're to the right of the tree. If x is negative, you're to the left of the tree. When you're looking at the sign of the velocity, that's the direction you're moving in. So you could be to the right of the tree and have a positive velocity, in which case you're moving to the right like this. Okay. You could also be on the positive side of the tree, okay, to the right of the, uh, of the tree, but your velocity might be negative, in which case you're moving this way. Yeah, you're on the right side of the tree, but you're moving towards the left. Okay, and so that's what a negative velocity means. All right, you could be on the left side of the tree and have a positive velocity, in which case you're moving to the right, even though you're on the left side of the tree. Okay, or you could be on the left side of the tree and you have a negative velocity, in which case you're moving even further to the left. All right, now the average velocity over the whole trip turned out to be negative 0.15 meters per second. What does that mean? Well, here you are at zero seconds and at four seconds you actually wind up at the one meter mark. I didn't draw it on this diagram because I didn't want to you know clutter the diagram but you know you start here and then you actually travel this way and then turned around and you travel back and you wound up over there at four seconds. So take a look on average you move to the left. That's why your average velocity over the whole trip is slightly negative. It's negative 0.15 meters per second. Okay so that explains the sign for 
x and it explains the sign for v. The sign for the acceleration, we'll get to that in a minute because it's a little bit more subtle. Uh, and uh, in fact, we'll see that even in the next lecture when I do constant acceleration. And so if it, if it doesn't totally, um, if you don't get your head around it quite yet, you it will, it'll eventually come. Just try your best for right now, okay? I agree that these, these ideas are a little bit subtle, okay? So, um, there we go. We've done um, instantaneous velocity and average velocity. Sorry, uh, we've done average velocity. Let's do now uh, instantaneous velocity. And then we'll do the same thing for the acceleration. So um, now that we understand average velocity, what is an instantaneous velocity? So the idea instantaneous, the word instantaneous means right now. Okay, whereas average means over an interval. So how in the world can you get an instantaneous velocity, a velocity right now, like right at this moment? So when you look at your speedometer, your speedometer doesn't give you an average velocity. Your speedometer tells you how fast you're going right now. Okay, how does that work? Well, the instantaneous velocity is an average velocity, but it's an average velocity where the time interval, that delta t, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Mathematically, that is known as infinitesimally small. It means as small as you can possibly make it. Okay. Um, now, there's two ways in which you can make delta t small, or not two ways, but there are two uh, realms in which you can think of it. Mathematically, you can make delta. You can always make delta t smaller. I mean, just give me a number like 0.1. I can make, I can find a number that's smaller than 0.1, but still bigger than 0. 0.01, 0.001, 0 0.0001. I mean, is there any limit? Is there any end to how small I can make my number? No, I can always make it smaller. And this, in, this has a, this is at the, right at the border with calculus. So we, we're not going to get into calculus, but this is right at the border of calculus. The, the word infinitesimally small means just make it infinitely small, but not zero. Okay. And that actually has math. You can actually do that mathematically. Uh, uh, it's just enough for you to understand it qualitatively. You don't have to worry about how you would actually do that mathematically, but just understand that, you know, uh, instantaneous just means that you make that delta T as small as possible. Theoretically, you can make it infinitesimally small. Experimentally, of course, you can't. Why? Well, because the delta t is limited, like any other measurement, by your instrument. Remember that from our first lecture? You know, the ruler, if your ruler's in millimeters, you can't measure anything smaller than millimeters. If your stopwatch, its smallest unit is 0 0.01 seconds, a hundredth of a second, then you can't measure a thousandth of a second. So experimentally, you could say that the delta t, you, you've reached your instantaneous velocity once you've reached the limit of the, the instrument, okay, the, the, the clock. Okay. And so um, that's good enough to understand it that way. Uh, so in reality, your, uh, your speedometer in your car, it's not doing any calculus. It really is calculating an average velocity, but it's not calculating an average velocity over half an hour. It's calculating an average velocity over a really, really short time interval. So as far as you're concerned, it doesn't really matter that it's not infinitely small. It's small enough. Okay, and so experimentally, there's this idea of small enough, the limit of your uh, of your instrument. That's all you need to know. Uh, all you need to think about when you think about instantaneous velocity. Okay, delta t is very very small. All right, so. Um, I can't really give you the uh, the calculus formula, nor nor do I want to. But you could just say your instantaneous velocity. Notice I've taken away the bar on top. Okay, your instantaneous velocity. It's exactly the same as your average velocity, but delta t is very small. Okay, so it's the same formula, but you have to understand that your delta t is very very small. Mathematically, it's infinitely small. Experimentally, it's as small as you can make it with your uh, instrument. Okay, well, let me give you graphical representations of the average versus the instantaneous velocity because I think that'll help. Okay, and you've done this in math, or you should have done this in math before, and that is the slope of a line. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this graph I have right here, and uh, I think I'm going to have to move. Yeah, I'm going to have to move my image. All right, let me move my image down here. Like that. All right. Okay. That's good enough. All right. So, uh, sorry, it's just clipped a little bit there. Just clipped a little bit off to the edge there, but it, it, you're not missing anything important. Um, this is a graph of position versus time. So um, you've done graphs before in mathematics, of course. Now, um, 
usually when you do math, you have a y-axis and an x-axis. All right, you put the x-axis on the horizontal axis. This is your independent variable, and you put y on your vertical axis. That's what you did. Most people do in math. But remember, in our case, our independent variable is time. So time goes on the horizontal axis, and x, which is dependent on the time, so that's the dependent variable that goes on the vertical axis. Okay, so don't let that be confusing. Uh, it, you know, um, it still is the same thing that you've learned in math. It's just the names have changed. So time along the horizontal uh, position along the vertical axis, and you can see here I've got this graph, this curve here, like that. See that curve there, like that. That's your x of t. I've got the curved line uh, marked off as x of, x of t. Okay, that's where you are at any given time. So if I were to say, you know, where am I at that time? Well, just like any other graph, you know, here I am at the time. You do draw a dotted line up to the graph, and you hit the graph there, and then you read off of the y-axis where you are. Or here, you know, where am I? Do 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 and then you go over to there. Or to pick another time, because I've got the slope in there, just ignore that for now, I can go up to here and I go all the way up to that point right there, the x versus t graph, and then I go over to there and that would be my position. So starting from a time, you can read off the position. Okay, you guys know how to read graphs, so there it is. Now, what is the average velocity? Can you get an average velocity out of this graph? Remember way back, I said that you can derive velocity from position. Here it is graphically. This is graphically how you do it. So uh, let's take a look at time t and then a later time t plus delta t. Okay, so here I am at time t and then tick, 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 tick. And there I am at a later time t plus delta t. So I've waited a time uh, delta t. So along the, the uh, horizontal axis here, I have a run of time delta t like that. OK, corresponding to that run of delta T over here, I have a rise of delta X. OK, and this line here is just a straight line that I drew with a ruler. And notice that the line passes through that point there and that point through. So that line passes through two points. And if you take the rise delta X divided by the run delta T, what's your rise divided by your run? delta x divided by delta t. Well, on the one hand, you could say delta x divided by delta t is the velocity, but rise over run is the slope. So the velocity of the graph is basically the slope of this line, okay? Because the slope of this line is delta x divided by delta t, like that, all right? Now, um, having said that, uh, notice that this is actually over a finite time interval. So here you're at t and here you are at some later time, say half an hour later, delta t, okay? And so this is a finite time interval and that's a finite interval there. And so this is the graph for an average velocity. All right, so this is how you get the average velocity from a position versus time graph. How do you get an instantaneous velocity out of this? Well, remember how you get from average to instantaneous. You have to take that delta t and make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, as I make my run smaller and smaller and smaller, this line here, keep this one, keep these two in place here. Okay, so keep t the same and x the same here. But make my delta t smaller, make my delta t smaller, make my delta t smaller. Notice that this point here is going to get closer and closer and closer to that point there. Okay, eventually the two points are going to coalesce. And then this line is going to actually not cross the graph at two points, it's actually going to cross it at one point. And that's my other graph here down here. Okay, so here is my other graph. Let me see how that looks good. Okay, so here's my other graph. What did I do? You'll notice that where's the t plus delta t? It I made the delta t so small that it squished right up into the t there like that. Okay, and of course there was a delta x up here and that delta x got so small that it squished right into the x there like that. Okay, and so now that line which was, was, which was crossing at two points now just crosses at one point. And a line which touches a curve at just one point is called a tangent line. The slope of this tangent line is the instantaneous velocity at that point right there. Okay, so uh, I hope this helps you intuitively, um, but there you go. Uh, you have basically a position versus a position versus a time uh, graph. And the answer to the question, how do I get, how do I get the velocity out of that? If you want the average velocity, well, then you do this. Okay, 
you basically, whoops, a little bit more. You basically do the slope between two points on the graph, t and t plus delta t. But if you want the instantaneous velocity, what you do is you simply find the tangent line at that point. OK, and the slope of that tangent line, there's the velocity. OK, so yeah, there's a relationship between the velocity and the position, and that's how you can derive the velocity from the position. The position versus time that contains all the kinematic information. But there are some questions like velocity and acceleration, which we'll look at next, that are a little bit hard to tease out of the position versus time. Now I've shown you how to get the velocity out of that. OK, so um, we won't actually use this. We won't actually use this in problem solving, but you know it is very good because some of these physics problems tend to be conceptually very difficult. Physics is not just math, okay? And so when you read these problems and, you're, and I'm asking for instantaneous velocity and so on, you know, or, uh, um, average velocity, you really need to think in terms of like all the tools that I've given you, all the conceptual tools that I've given you to really be able to appreciate it. It is possible to do so. Just you know, think about this and uh, even though you don't use this directly, you will use these concepts indirectly in solving the problems. Okay, so um, now uh, oh, let me move my image back up here. There we go. So now um, we're done with the velocity. There's an average velocity and there's an instantaneous velocity. And let's turn to the acceleration. Well, I don't have to go through the same detail with the acceleration uh, because there's both an average and, uh, and uh, instantaneous acceleration. They are very similar to the average and instantaneous velocities. Okay, so let me just give you the definitions and then we can just jump into a, a couple of problems. All right, so the average average acceleration, and again, you see the bar on top there, that bar means average, A, that's going to be the change in velocity divided by the time it takes for that change to occur. All right, so remember what acceleration is. It's a speeding up or slowing down. If the velocity doesn't change, in other words, your initial and final velocity are the same. Say you're at 50 kilometers per hour, that's your initial velocity. You end at 50 kilometers per hour, that's your final velocity. 50 minus 50 is zero. If you've got no change in velocity, you have no acceleration, okay? And so your average acceleration is your change in velocity divided by the time it takes to make that change, all right? Well, is there an instantaneous acceleration? Yes. It looks like exactly the same formula. The bar is gone, but now that delta t has to be small. Okay. And again, what does small mean? Mathematically, it could be infinitesimally small. That's technically calculus, okay, which we won't do. But experimentally, it's just as small as you can make it with the instrument that you have. Okay. And that's what we mean by uh, instantaneous. All right. So there we go. Average and instantaneous uh, acceleration. All right. Uh, that's enough for our theory. Let's uh, do um, some problems here. Okay, actually, I think I only have one problem. Um, next class, we're going to have a lot more problems. Um, I need to build up the theory a little bit before we can address some more complicated problems. But uh, here I have a car and it speeds up from 50 kilometers an hour to 100 kilometers an hour in 10 seconds. And I ask, what is the average acceleration? Okay, so first of all, let's ask, is there an acceleration at all? Like, is the acceleration zero? Well, look, if you start at 50 kilometers per hour and you speed up to 100 kilometers per hour, remember acceleration is a speeding up. So yeah, there is an acceleration, okay? So if you know how much the velocity changed and you know the time it takes to make that velocity change, that's your average acceleration, all right? Now, um, remember from our first lecture, uh, we are going to work in MKS. I didn't explicitly say here, answer in MKS, but, uh, you know, because we're doing this together, but like certainly on a test, I would be very explicit about what I want for an answer. OK, but, you know, for the purposes of this problem, let's work in MKS units. So the first thing we need to do is convert from kilometers per hour to meters per second. OK, uh, kilometers is a measure of length, but it's not the MKS measure of length. The MKS measure of length is meters and hours is a measure of time, but it's not the MKS measure of times. We need seconds. OK, and so let's convert the initial velocity. So this is V as zero. All right, so again, that's the functional notation. This is at t equals zero. At t equals zero seconds, the velocity is 50 kilometers per hour. And to convert that, we multiply by our conversion fractions here. So to convert the kilometers, we put kilometers on the bottom and meters on top. A thousand meters is equal to one kilometer. So this fraction right here is equal to one. 
All right. And then we also want to get rid of hours and go to seconds. So hours is in the denominator here. Put it in the numerator there so it cancels. And seconds in the denominator. One hour is 3,600 seconds. So again, this fraction here is one. Okay, so all we did was take 50 kilometers per hour and multiply it by one twice. Okay, but a specially crafted fraction, which is equal to one, and that turns out to be 13.9 meters per second. Okay, and we actually did exactly this calculation uh, last lecture. All right, uh, what about the velocity at 10 seconds? So the velocity at 10 seconds is now 100 kilometers per hour. Same two fractions. Okay, and when we multiply that out, we're going to get 27.8 meters per second okay so the um, uh, change in the velocity is going to be your final uh, sorry yeah the change in velocity is going to be your final velocity minus your initial velocity final velocity is 27.8 meters per second minus your initial velocity 13.9 meters per second and your time that it takes well you started off at zero seconds you got up to 10 seconds is going to be 10 minus zero or 10 seconds okay and that turns out to be an acceleration of 1.39 meters per second squared okay so there's the answer now before we're done how did i get these units here so remember every time i introduce a new concept i'm not only going to do some uh, problems with it but i'm going to show you how the units the mks units uh, the mks units for acceleration are meters per second squared why well here we go so we have an acceleration it doesn't matter whether it's the average or instantaneous and the units of acceleration are basically the units of velocity divided by the units of time. The units of velocity are meters per second. Okay, the units of time are second. So meters per second divided by seconds. So we actually get two seconds in the denominator. So that's a second squared. So units of acceleration are meters per second squared. Okay. Finally, let's talk about the sign for acceleration. This is subtle, but it's worth going over. All right, so let's scroll all the way up here to the top to our diagram and look at it again. All right, here we are. Here's our diagram. So just to remind you, if X is positive, you're on the right side of the tree. If X is negative, you're on the left side. If V is positive, it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right side of the tree. If V is positive, you're moving to the right. If V is negative, you're moving to the left. But what happens if A is positive or A is negative? Well, let's first address the question if both V and A are positive. So A is positive and V is positive. Okay, and just to remind you, V is how fast you're going, A is how fast you're speeding up. So V is how fast are you going, and if since it's positive, you're going to the right. If you've got an acceleration and it's positive, not only are you going to the right, but you're speeding up to the right. So I'll try to demonstrate this with my cursor here. So you start off slower and then you go faster, 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 faster. Okay, let me try that again. I didn't do such a good job. So you start off slow and then faster, 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 faster. Okay, so that's V is positive. You're moving to the right and A is positive. So you're speeding up to the right. So you start off slow and then you go faster and then you go faster still. Okay, what if V is positive and A is negative? All right. That means you're moving to the right, but you're being sped up to the left. In other words, you're being slowed down. So if V is positive, you're moving this way, but A is negative, you're actually slowing down. So here we are. I'll try to demonstrate that. Okay. So V is positive, and then you slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. You eventually stop. And if you wait, you'll actually turn around and start going back the other way, accelerating out the other way. So the acceleration is sort of the direction in which the velocity is changing. All right, so even though the velocity is positive, A is negative, it says you're changing the velocity always so, so that it's going towards the, the negative direction, okay? Sometimes we call that deceleration, all right? So um, there it is. Now, it also works the other way. If A is negative and V is negative, then you're going to the left and you're speeding up to the left. If V is negative and A is positive, then you're moving to the left, but you're slowing down and being accelerated towards the right. OK, so I admit that's a little bit hard to see, but, you know, it's good to introduce it at this point. And then in next lecture, when I do constant acceleration, we're going to be throwing things up and down. And you have a little bit better intuition with, you know, throwing things up and down because I'm sure everyone has thrown a ball up into the air. And so we'll do the kinematics of, you know, things that, are, you know, fall things that are falling or things that you throw up and then eventually fall down. And there you'll see a much, you'll have a much better picture of what the relationship is between the velocity and the acceleration. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Thank you.